Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, we're really excited to give this presentation on uh, the Heights School in uh, the Arlington area. Um, really excited to hear about this building. I know I don't know if many of you guys have had a chance to see it, but it's a really exciting and fun new feature of the Rosalyn area. So joining us, we have Jason Myers um, with Silman. He was the structural engineering project manager on the project. Um, we also have Tyler uh, Swartzwelder, a project manager from the construction team at Gilbane. Um, and we also have with us uh, from uh, the Bjork Ingalls group, we have Tony Scheiber, um, who was the senior architect uh, on the project. Um, I'm going to start with a short bio for each of our presenters, and then they'll be able to get into it. Uh, Jason Myers joined Silman in 2013 as a structural engineer. He has a strong build, a background in technical design and new construction and renovating of existing buildings. Um, as a project manager for the structural engineering of the project, he has worked on multiple new construction projects, including the recently completed structure for the Heights building, as well as renovation projects, coordinating the scope and schedule with the agency, architect, and other engineers in accordance with the guidelines of the project. Tyler Schwarzwelder is the project executive at Gilbane Building Con Company, has 14 years of industry experience focusing on all aspects of project delivery from preconception through completion. In that time, he has served in various roles and has worked on a variety of projects ranging from high schools to museum. Tyler recently completed the Heights Building and is currently managing construction of the Arlington Public Schools new elementary school at the Reed site and the Design Build Metro DC headquarters. Uh, shout out, he received his BAE in a architectural engineering from Pennsylvania State University. Um, and last but not least, uh, Tony Schreiber joined Bjork Ingalls Group in 2016 and is currently a senior architect overseeing the River Street Master Plan, a 1.3 million square foot mixed use development on the Brooklyn, New York waterfront. Prior to this, Tony was the project architect of the Heights School, a 18, 180,000 square foot secondary school in Arlington, Virginia, you'll hear about today. He has also been part of the project team for a 2.6 million square foot master plan of the Smithsonian Institute, as well as many other projects in the New York area. Tony holds a bachelor's of architecture degree from the University of Kentucky and a master's of architectural degree from Cornell University. So thank you all again for joining us and I will turn it over to um, Jason, Tony and Tyler. Thank you guys. Um, so I'm going to kick this off uh, with a, a bit of an overview over, uh, of the design of the building um, and then uh, pass along to Jason and then following up uh, with Tyler. And um, thanks for having us. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to give this presentation. Uh, next. So I just wanted to kind of set the stage for the project. Um, the original prompt was to relocate an existing uh, building um, in a relatively suburban area to a site uh, in downtown Roslyn and a much more dense site uh, with a lot less land. Um, so that was kind of one of the overarching challenges, uh, how to ensure that all the programmatic requirements of the, of the schools can be housed in the new building, but also uh, maximizing the amount of open space and, uh, and green space for the students and teachers to play, to learn outside, et cetera. Next. Um, as we do with, uh, with all of our uh, projects, we went through numerous iterations, all of which kind of emphasize these exterior terraces. Um, and the winning scheme, um, even though this is a bit of an earlier iteration of it, uh, was the uh, fanning, what we call the fanning bar scheme, which features five uh, rectilinear volumes that fan around a pivot point uh, that kind of fan down toward the, the field and the site below. Next. Um, so just a kind of quick diagram series. Um, the existing site was around 95 or is around 95,000 square feet. Um, we, we started out by massing the, the programmatic volumes that were required um, and also locating the, the field uh, kind of per the, the input we received from the end users. Um, what we resulted with, as you see in the middle diagram, is essentially a stack of five, what we called classrooms, classroom bars. And, um, and in a more traditional typology, you would kind of see everything stacked um, and, and the exterior spaces all at, at ground level. Um, what we chose to do is take those bars and fan them out um, so they become an extension of the terrace and allow for 
um, or an extension of the field and, and allow for exterior terraces adjacent to the interior classrooms. <laughs> Next. Underneath those five classroom bars, um, we housed uh, a series of public facing programs. Um, so the theater, the main gymnasium, and a second uh, auxiliary gymnasium, all of which have some public components as well as school based components. Um, directly above those, so kind of in the space between the, the floors in, that, that have housed the classrooms and the larger public facing volumes, we housed some of the shared student spaces. So the library, the cafeteria, the, the lobbies, and the, and the um, uh, music rehearsal spaces. And so ultimately what we tried to create was uh, what Bjarke uh, calls a landscape of learning where the, the roof terraces uh, due to the span typology allow for landscapes that, that can be utilized for different learning experiences. Next. Uh, this is just kind of a conceptual diagram of taking that traditional typology and by separating the individual levels, you create a series of exterior spaces. Next. And so then the kind of final site plan. So we have the field to the north of the site, uh, Wilson Boulevard to the south of the site. Um, just to point out, each terrace was programmed slightly differently. So uh, the lowest level, so the, the more, most northern terrace, um, we have the most active uh, programming, so potential for performances and, uh, and larger gatherings. Um, then we have an urban farming terrace. We have kind of terraces for smaller classrooms moving up. And then all the way at the top terrace, we have a series of kind of more private, intimate spaces for smaller two, three student gatherings. Um, the, the main entrance from the field is roughly centered on the building in the, uh, uh, at the north. The main visitor's entrance uh, is at the east of the building, which is actually at a location where all of the different pivoting volumes creates a four-story atrium space. And then we have the main uh, triple height Wilson entry at the south and at the south of the site underneath bar four, um, which is, uh, yeah, uh, I won't explain that. Next. So here we have uh, just an image of kind of the final uh, the final building um, as it stands now. Um, this is a view from the field um, at the looking toward the pivot, um, which we'll get into more depth uh, later in the presentation. Next. And then a view from Wilson Boulevard. Um, and so you see the triple height entry underneath bar four. Um, I think kind of an important element to point out here is the significant cantilever at bar four, um, which required quite a bit of structural coordination. Um, also a, a column free space uh, in that lobby area. Next. So uh, programmatically, just to kind of reiterate, we have kind of the, the five classroom bars, uh, one at each level that house the main classroom programs. Um, we have what we call the in-between spaces, which are more of the shared student spaces. And then at, at the ground level, we have the more public uh, community facing programming of the theater, the gym, and the auxiliary gym. Next. So here we have kind of a rendered view and I've, I've mixed up renders with some of the, the photographs from the, the, the final uh, <laughs> building. But uh, so here we have a view uh, from Wilson Boulevard lobby entrance. And so to the right of that white wall would be the outside of the theater. Um, we have the gymnasium in uh, the green color directly ahead of us, the library, which is one of those in-between spaces above, above it, um, and then a large seating stair area for uh, gatherings of students, uh, maybe like projections and, and small lectures and meetings. And, and then above the library, you see one of the classroom bar volumes kind of crashing through. Next. A view of the, the built condition. Um, this is taken from level three, so kind of the highest level looking down toward the lobby. So you see the seating steps and to the right uh, where, the, where the glass is, the, the classroom bar. Next. And then kind of moving in a bit, um, again, you have the gymnasium to the left, stairs down to uh, the black box theater, which you can make out in, in black below. 
um, the, the administrative areas are in the orange and yellow colored zones, and then the classroom bar above. Next. So the two kind of primarily uh, or more public facing programs, the gym and the theater, both kind of require larger spans. And so these are, these are kind of axos to show the, the general makeup, gym being a double height space and theater being a, a triple height space. Next. Uh, here's a, a, a finished image of the gym. Um, next. And of the theater. So both of these spaces uh, required, you know, kind of more typical larger, larger spans. Uh, the gym had a series of girders and the, the theater series of trusses, as I'm sure Jason and Tyler will get into. Next. The in-between spaces or kind of the shared, let's say, shared student spaces. We have the cafeteria, the library, and then the music rehearsal zones. Um, and these all exist above kind of the, the, the larger public facing programs. Next. So the, all of these, these different programs, we, we tried to use woods to kind of warm the, the spaces um, and create uh, some sort of similar material component throughout. So here we have the cafeteria with, with the wood making up the, the main uh, uh, dining area. Next. The, the library, we, we basically uh, conceived as these three volumes around which the books wrap. So rather than having the stacks kind of hidden off there on display, and again, we use kind of these, these warmer woods um, to, to allow for kind of a more comfortable environment. Next. And uh, one of the two large music rehearsal spaces. So you can actually see what would be classroom bar four kind of crashing through this one in white on the left side of the image. And then again, kind of warming the space with, with woods, uh, similar to the other two in-between spaces. Next. So then as we get into the classroom bars, um, I, I neglected to mention, but each of the classroom bars is, is uh, comprised of a series of colors. And over the height of the building, um, you get an expanded gradient of colors. So um, this is a view down one of the corridors. And so you can see to the right and the left, the colors from above and below kind of merging um, to, to create this expanded gradient. Um, you can also notice uh, somewhat the interior stairs that are existing on the left and the right. And so these kind of connect all five of the classroom bars. Um, and directly above them, you have an exterior uh, terrace stair that connects all the terraces. So this relationship creating the central axis throughout these corridors that connects both the interior and the exterior classroom programming was also kind of uh, important in creating a sense of kind of community and, and encouraging uh, interaction between students. Next. And so a view from the terraces outside, you can see the, the exterior stair uh, that I was just mentioning that kind of connects all of the, the, the four large terraces. Um, the, the terrace in the middle, you see these large planters that can be used for kind of urban farming. On the left, you see the kind of smaller zones that can be used for uh, some classroom breakout sessions. And then the, the terrace on the, the bottom, on the far right of the image, uh, you have these kind of sloped uh, grassy areas that allow for students to gather and you know, uh, view potentially a performance in that, uh, in that paved area between the two. Next. And then um, just kind of a view uh, down the stairs so you kind of see how, how the different terraces become connected by this central stair. Next. Um, an, another view from the athletic field. So, and this will come up in the future. The, the CMU wall to the right is actually uh, the barrier between a temporary fire station um, that's on the site currently and, and our building. Um, and then there's some additional scaffolding uh, that's a remnant of the construction going on to the left of the building. Next. Um, and then just kind of a, sorry for the pixelation, but uh, just kind of an overview of uh, the, an aerial of the, of the building uh, as it stands today. Um, so you can see all the, the greenery of the terraces, um, the classroom bars, I think, become very visible in you know, one level per, per fan. 
um, and then underneath you have the glassy in between spaces and then directly behind uh, below those you have the white brick uh, rain screen clad theater and gym volumes. Next. So just kind of briefly to tee up some of the structural concepts uh, you, next. Um, so basically we have three or four large span areas. Um, we have the triple height uh, space underneath bar four, which is essentially cantilevered over that, that glazing system um, and column three next. You have the theater volume, and this is a section just past that elevation, a th the theater volume to the right, which has the, the large trusses at the theater, um, and then the gym volume to the left, which has the, the girders spanning in the opposite direction. Um, and then in the center of the image, you do see that lobby again, so you see that it is uh, another long span that required some coordination, both to ensure that the span could be uh, captured by the structural design, but then also to ensure that the, the depth of the structure and the systems, et cetera, was all within that, that thickness of the ceiling. Um, and so that kind of required a lot of gymnastics to, to get to next. Um, next, just to kind of show the section in the opposite direction. So here, yeah, if you go to the section again, yeah, perfect. Um, so here, you have that lobby space and you can see the, the highest uh, level that the section is cut through is classroom bar four. So you see that kind of cantilevered um, over that uh, lobby area, but then also classroom bars three and two have a similar type of cantilever. So you get quite a cavernous space that was really meant to be kind of this like central organizing element uh, around which all the pivoting of the, of the volumes happens. Next. Um, just to kind of quickly touch on a few of the facade uh, details that require some coordination. So we have, um, we, we had the desire to increase the amount of glazing. So we created some ceiling geometries and had to coordinate with, with the structural elements to ensure that the beams kind of worked within that, that ceiling geometry, allowing for the maximum glazing height and also accommodating the drop slab at the terraces. Next. Um, just a, section, a quick section detail that shows the transition from the interior slab to the, the slab at the, at the terrace um, and, and the build up there. Next. Uh, this is kind of a typical detail at the header of the glazing. So you see how the, the beams, and they varied in depth, but they really had to kind of fit within that, that uh, ceiling profile that, that we had designed in order to maximize the glazing. Next. And then kind of a, a typical section detail through the theater volumes ceiling, uh, which is the floor of the music rehearsal spaces uh, requiring acoustic separation. So you can see kind of how that uh, started to come together. The isolators next. And then um, just very briefly before Jason gets into this. So the kind of key structural element that I think everyone's interested in is this uh, what's happening at the pivot. And we went through a lot of different iterations, which I know Jason is going to talk about. Um, and we kind of wound up on a version of this helical uh, column scheme next, except where the, the columns were pulled into the, the opaque wall and uh, in, in plane with both walls to ensure that program area and in, in plan was not lost. Um, so we get essentially a, a truss system on the opaque wall um, next. And just a few images to show the, the under construction uh, of, the, of the pivot. So um, on the left, we have bar fours framing beginning. And on the right, we have the, the bar five uh, structural uh, being installed. And you can see the, I, I know, again, I won't get into all of this, but I know Tyler will be talking about how this uh, was sequenced in order to uh, erect the trusses around some of the site uh, obstacles next. Just a few more images. On the left, we have kind of the, the final uh, pivot with the waterproofing, the glazing, and louvers installed, uh, prepping for the, the brick rain screen, which you can see being installed on the right. Next. And just kind of a final image. So this is uh, kind of where we are uh, with, with the building. And um, I'll, I'll let Jason kind of 
uh, pick it up from here. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> Um, so as Tony showed, the, the fanning bars concept was really the primary driver for all the unique structural opportunities and, and challenges of the projects, project. Um, it included the, the landscape terraces, the, the green spaces next to the classrooms, um, and it included the, the large open volumes. Those are the shared community spaces uh, below the volumes. Um, that's where the gymnasium, theater, and atrium are, are located. Um, it included the lateral system, um, as you can see, it's it's not a square building uh, by any means, even though that we have some uh, fairly uh, rectangular uh, parts to it. And then the, the floating buttresses um, developed to support the floating corners of the bar. So the, the terraces function as outdoor learning spaces. Um, they're designed to support a variety of intensive plantings, trees, and landscape features. Uh, this really contributes to the sustainability goals of the project. Each terrace has a different layout, layout of uh, vegetated and hardscaped areas. And as we see in this image, um, there's a lot of variety of uh, different planting areas. Each, each terrace is different. Um, there are uh, some very highly loaded areas, uh, maximum soil heights of, of five foot seven, uh, resulting in almost 500 PSF of, of soil load. And then we have the shade and the shade and ornamental trees. Uh, those added another 800 PSF over the areas that were associated with each tree. And those those associated areas were based on um, the root ball diameter of the tree when it was planted. And we worked with a landscaped architect and a horticulturist uh, to determine what a tree would weigh in its mature state. And um, what what load that would would impart on the terraces? It's it's quite a heavy load. And then there's landscape features also. So uh, these are primarily precast concrete elements. Um, we have uh, benches and planter boxes. You can see those in uh, the top of bar two and the top of bar four. These are some seating areas. Um, so there's really a significant amount of dead load um, and occupancy live load that that was uh, on this building, uh, very atypical. Um, each terrace had a stair that connects to the adjacent terrace. So in Tony's photo of uh, the corridor, you could see uh, a stair on the left and the right uh, connecting the classroom spaces. Um, it was really a, a two level stair. There's the stair that connects the, the terrace level. So you can see those here in red. And then, um, there's a, the stair below that mirrors that. So here uh, we just show the image of uh, that two level stair. Um, these were framed with um, steel and precast concrete uh, treads and risers. Uh, the upper stair has two, two layers. Uh, there's the outer layer of precast and that's the, um, the structural element that, that connects um, an upper ter terrace here with a lower terrace over here. And then there's a lower level of uh, steel deck and that supports the um, waterproofing and insulation systems. And then on the lower, the lower stair, it's primarily just uh, the precast structural element. Both of those are supported by steel. Um, on the upper stair, um, we hung supports from the terrace above. And then on the lower stair, we post it up uh, to provide the supports. So in typical school design, the classroom module is standardized for um, uniformity of program. Um, and even with the unique fanning bars concept, we still had that standardized module. So each bar uh, contains classrooms on its upper level on either side of a central corridor. So um, you can see this area here is a classroom uh, space. There's a central corridor down the middle here and then classrooms on the other side. So Selman studied different framing options for the terraces and, and settled on a uniform layout of framing with two lines of columns, one down uh, each side of the corridor. Um, this was opposed to, uh, let's say, a more closely uh, spaced layout of beams under the, the highly loaded landscaped areas. Um, we found that this was most economical from a material standpoint. Um, it also allowed uh, a shallow corridor framing 
uh, down the middle here, as you can see, um, for MEP routing. And so uh, the MEP uh, branches off from the, the central pivot, it extends down the corridors, and then it branches off into the classrooms. Um, so keeping this framing uniform uh, simplified erection and allowed us to just only bear, vary the, the beam sizes and the column sizes. And then typical deck was selected uh, based on the, the characteristic loading condition for uh, most of the terrace. And then it was just reinforced under the, the more highly loaded areas. So essentially we had stronger deck and larger beams under the uh, more highly loaded landscaped areas. Um, so we kept the framing uniform, but what happens below? Um, so due to the unique geometry of the fanning bars concept, um, column transfers were unavoidable, uh, but we, we could keep them to a minimum with careful planning. So as you see here in this image, um, as each bar is rotated in plan over a bar below, the, the framing intersects. Uh, so the primary line of, of intersection is, is right where the the terrace transitions to classroom space uh, right along this line. And, and Tony showed the image of um, a girder kind of nested up into that space where that step occurs. So it was kind of a natural place to put a, a deep heavy member. Um, and this was, this was an ideal location to, to transfer out columns. So um, the columns for the bar above that are, are supporting terrace loads, um, those are kept fairly uniform along this line. And obviously those don't those don't line up with corridor walls or classroom walls along this line. So this ended up uh, transferring out most of those columns. Um, we kept an, another reason to keep the uh, framing uniform on the terrace level was to keep the, the framing depth shallow. Uh, so as Tony showed, um, we wanted to keep the, the glazing maximized on that, that side to let in the most amount of light. And so that line of framing on the terrace was kept fairly shallow. Um, and it also meant that these transfer girders, as they came in, um, had to be tapered at the ends uh, to meet up with that ceiling. So each of these heavy um, W36 transfer girders have tapered ends. Um, so then internal to the bar, once we get into this space here, um, you can see that it quickly uh, kind of turns into chaos. Um, but we, we kept the, the framing as uh, simplified as we could. We kept it orthogonal to the bars where we could. And then we tried to find um, locations where walls aligned below so that we could drop columns straight down to the foundation. And where we couldn't do that, we had a, a column transfer. Um, the overhaul, overall building height limitation and the, the theater clear height requirements restricted the depth that we had available for structure over the theater. Um, so we, we studied plate girders and trusses in this area and found that um, shallow trusses assembled from wide flange sections were, were most economical. And so the criteria that we used for the layout of the web members of these trusses was, was fourfold. Um, first, in optimal truss design, um, webs are placed between 30 and 60 degrees. Uh, this really economizes the, the material in the webs themselves. And then um, the second was col the columns from the crossing bar above dictated where a panel point on a given truss could be. Um, third, we wanted the, the webs to be aligned for a straight run of MEP routing. And then fourth, uh, we wanted to limit the number of, of different trusses to as few as possible to, to gain some economy in fabrication. Um, so the design process was that we overlaid uh, the trusses to find those common panel points from the columns above. Um, then we fit the webs in based on that 30 to 60 degree rule. And then we grouped the trusses by uh, the loads that were on those trusses. And then we designed the trusses. And so ultimately we ended up with four different truss designs um, out of 12 total trusses over the theater. Um, also in the, in the public space areas, um, this theater, um, we had, uh, like Tony said, a three-story height uh, space in this area. So in typical buildings, the foundation walls are supported by slabs near grade. Um, and so in this image, that would be uh, right about here. This allows for um, cross-lot force transfer through the slabs. And that's, uh, that's considered a balanced condition with soil pressure on either side of the building. 
here, as you can see, the, the main seating area was about one level below grade. And so these, cantilever, these walls were cantilevered up uh, to support that soil. Um, so that cross lot transfer actually occurs down here. Um, the, the, this configuration amplified those forces though. Um, but even then the, the slabs sloped and stepped for the seating. Uh, you can see uh, the stem walls that are built up with steps in them. Um, the, the structural slab is actually below this and it also steps. And then another uh, layer of, of framing will, will be over this. And so that allows for MEP routing and um, air supply uh, below the theater's uh, seating. So what this did was it, it created a condition of compartmentalized diaphragms where forces had to transfer through um, these stem walls and around the recesses. And um, it was really a combination of, of um, axial forces through the slabs at different levels. Um, so this upper slab, the lower slab, and then um, forces being transferred through the diaphragms around the recesses. Um, and then all the steel framing, of course, was designed for those conditions. The steel was um, designed for compression and, uh, and compression forces and um, connections were designed for those compression forces. In the atrium, um, we also had a floor depth restriction here. Um, we have up to 65 foot clear spans uh, at the end of the bars, uh, where bars five, bar five and three um, kind of merge uh, that 65 foot decreases. Um, we found that heavy standard sections were most economical um, and we had to double up some of those uh, for the girders that were supporting the columns that supported the truss above, the, the terrace above. Um, so the, the unique condition over here, is, as Tony mentioned, is the, the cantilever condition. Um, so on uh, the west side here, we have a cantilever that's about 11 foot. And then on the east side over here, we have a cantilever of about 15 foot. Um, and those distances are from uh, the column, the supporting column. And of course, uh, those cantilevers um, support terrace loads and trees above. So um, heaviest loads on the, on the end of a cantilever. Um, and as you can see in this photo, the, the soffit depth was um, set to align with the, the exterior banding of the building. And so those, those large cantilevers uh, had to fit within that space. So um, on the west side, uh, we had a, a standard shape that was dapped to fit within that 24 inch, uh, excuse me, 28 inch space that we had available. Um, and then on this side, we had a custom, um, a custom plate girder that was a consistent depth uh, through the back. So the girder on the, on the west here was a W36 by 487, um, and that was dapped to the 28 inches. And then the girder on the east side was uh, 28 inches deep, um, built up with four inch by 20 inch flanges and two one and a half inch thick webs. Um, we also had a relatively short backspan condition uh, for that east girder. So it required a tension column anchor within, uh, within bar five. Um, and then another framing um, opportunity that we had was uh, on this end uh, because of the floor depth restriction um, along here, uh, we decided it would be best to put a large deep girder uh, nested into this opaque wall up here. So there's a W44 by 335 up here. And then there are hanger columns that come down uh, to pick up some typical floor framing um, on the soffit. Uh, another condition was this VS1 curtain wall system. So this is hung from the, the bar above and we have some miscellaneous framing um, under there to, uh, to support that. And then as, as Tyler will get into, um, we also had a temporary box out right about here for a tower crane um, based on uh, sequencing of, of steel erection, um, made it the best place to put that. Um, so that was infill framing uh, to follow on uh, after the crane was removed. Um, in the gym, again, we had a uh, depth restriction, 65 foot clear spans, um, heavy loads from the library and terrace above. Um, uh, the depth available for structure was less than we had at the theater. So 
Um, we initially planned for trusses in this area too, but there just wasn't enough depth to get something uh, reasonable to work. So um, heavy standard sections and plate girders were found to be the most economical here. Um, and the, uh, one of the nice features of this building is the uh, assembly stairs. Um, there's actually two of them, um, creates a nice connecting space for uh, the occupants. So um, this first one is um, a stair that connects the library, which is up here on the right, to the um, lobby atrium that was, is down here on the left. And then the other one connects the lobby, which is up here, uh, down to the level with the gymnasium, which is on the right, and the theater over here on the left. Uh, precast was initially considered for both of these, um, similar to uh, stadium treads and risers, but uh, it wasn't ideal uh, due to logistical and construction sequencing. Um, so steel framed uh, with cast in place treads and risers uh, were used. On this lower one, we had slab on foam on the, the lower portion uh, to simplify uh, construction and then a transition to um, the cast in place on, on steel. Um, so the requirements for egress led to stair locations being placed at the ends of bars one, three, and five. So um, this bar is one, this bar is three, and this bar is five. Um, so someone took advantage of those stair locations and, and located our shear walls there. So those couple with the um, core to provide a tangential load resisting path around the building. And in order for that to work, uh, bars two and four um, were tied to the to the diaphragms of bars one, three, and five with um, collectors to create that continuous load resisting path. Um, to complicate things a little bit, there were several openings in the slabs. Um, I've already mentioned the, um, the theater, uh, the assembly stairs in bar four. There's also the black box uh, theater in bar one uh, back here and an auxiliary gym over here. Um, as well as um, some other recesses and, and dropped areas uh, to accommodate program. Um, so similar to what we did in the theater, those required um, a compartmentalized approach uh, to resolve those diaphragm forces. And um, struts and collectors uh, were used to, to resolve those forces into the perimeter foundation walls. Um, one unique aspect of uh, the truss layout, which I'll, I'll get into shortly, was um, that it really it really creates a global lean and twist on this core back here. So um, the trusses inherently want to want to lean over to the left and create kind of a, a clockwise a counterclockwise rotation on the core. So um, the core wall resolves those forces um, ab above grade, but once it gets below grade, those forces have to come out and get into the in the perimeter walls. So um, all the diaphragms below are designed uh, to transfer those forces back to the perimeter. Um, we use different um, slab, different reinforced slabs and struts and collectors to get those forces uh, back to the, um, the foundation walls. Um, so the rotation of the bars created a unique sequence of, of floating corners at each side of each end of the bars. Um, and so multiple concepts were evaluated uh, to support those, those corners. And the first one was um, a cantilevered beam concept. Um, and in this concept, uh, a beam was placed um, at the corner of each of those bars and it was um, brought back to the core. And then um, we, we tried to locate columns to align with at least a couple of those, those diagonals and pick them up um, and put those on interior space inside the building. Um, what that did was, um, it, it's a fairly simple uh, construction, fairly simple design, but it created a, a ring of columns around the core that, that took up some valuable program. And then, so next we look at, we looked at um, trusses on the ends of each bar, uh, excuse me, the sides. And in this concept, the, the sides are, are trussed and um, a column is placed um, as far out as we could get it, but still interior to the building. Um, and again, that created a, a ring of columns around here that, that took a program. 
So next we looked at a helical column, column scheme. Um, and this helical column concept uh, really laid the groundwork for what ultimately became the floating buttress concept. Um, in the helical concept, each uh, vertically aligned column leaned as the bar was rotated. And it creates one helical line of force uh, at each corner. Um, so as you can see here, if you can imagine that all, all, four of the, all five of these bars are stacked and aligned with columns in the corners, uh, once you rotate these bars out, um, the columns lean over and you, you end up with this, uh, this helical uh, framing concept. It's actually quite beautiful and elegant, um, but it, it also swallowed up some interior programs. So at the corners of each of these bars, um, there's a column that, that connects um, through the space and, and it, took, it took quite a bit of program away. Um, so to preserve that program, um, each of these helical columns were pushed out to the ends of the bars and that ultimately led to um, essentially a web member in a truss. And so um, once we did that, um, it created a vertical discontinuity that was resolved by adding another diagonal uh, to the west side of each bar. So once each of these helical columns was, was pushed out um, onto the end to form this truss, um, we had a, a vertical offset and vertical forces. And so we put this diagonal in here that became the, the floating buttress. Um, in this image, uh, what you see here in blue, these are all the um, primary compression lines and uh, the red is the primary tension lines. And as you can see, we, we ended up um, with a little bit of the helical element still in place. Um, what happens was, was it just kind of shifted to the right. Um, once we tracked all the forces and put in all the other web, web members for the trusses, um, it really behaved this way that, uh, that those web members were all linked together. And so a lot of the gravity load went through those. And that ultimately resolved all the vertical forces uh, down to the found foundation. But that vertical offset in, um, in force flow also created some out of plane forces. So uh, as you can imagine, a, a vertical force here um, transfers over to here. You have this horizontal force couple that's, that's developed. And that occurs at each one of the, the buttresses. And so those forces are tied back to the concrete core uh, with struts. So you can see in this image, the, the light blue lines are all the struts that we needed to, to resolve those forces. And it essentially um, turned into essentially a, a braced frame in the floor system or a truss in the floor system. Um, so as I mentioned before, uh, all these, uh, the accumulation of all these forces uh, really tried to, to push this tower over and also twist it. Um, so it was an interesting development in the design. Um, one, of the, one of the primary goals of the design was to, to simplify erection. So each truss was designed in detail to be built in part or in whole on the ground and lifted into place. Um, so part of that concept was to have the, the, the truss cords pass over one another. So in this image, you can see um, a top cord for a lower truss and a bottom cord for an upper truss, and they pass over one another. Um, additionally, similar to the, the theater trusses, designs were, were grouped into two different trusses for economy. So the, the upper two trusses and the lower two trusses were uh, essentially the same design. Um, so this is an image of um, one of those trusses uh, one of those truss connections as it passes over. Um, this is a uh, top cord of a lower truss, and this is a uh, bottom cord of an upper truss. And it, it's we, we created it with just simple bearing plates and cap plates so the truss could be erected and set into place. Um, one of the, the complexities of these connections though was um, how the, the vertical and horizontal forces of the system work together with um, wide flange sections. So we tried to keep um, everything uh, typically bolted and um, just dealt with uh, 
the three-dimensional flow of forces with stiffeners that were um, placed inside the, the cords. Uh, this shows an image of the struts coming in, um, the gusseted connections into the side of the cord, and then the stiffeners uh, that are aligned with, with things above and below. Um, so once we got those forces back to the core, um, we created connections with, again, a, a bolted gusset plate connection that's welded to the embed plates. Um, we have these embed plates uh, throughout the core that have deep bars um, that extend into the walls to, to resolve those forces. Um, and this is a, a final image of construction. Um, here you can see the, the bearing plates uh, between the trusses, uh, standard gusset plates. Um, we can see some of the struts into the floors and we can see some of the gusset plates uh, for the struts. Um, again, uh, truss above, truss below. Uh, we can see those uh, bearing plate connections, the gusset plates, um, and some of the, the floor struts. So ultimately, um, a, a beautiful uh, piece of the building uh, that we're very proud of. Um, and then I'd like to, to touch on collaboration a little bit. Um, we have an internal tracking tool um, to track tonnages um, through our analysis and drafting models. Um, we use these internally. Uh, to determine layouts and systems. On this project, we used it uh, er, during early stages to help with estimating and keep aligned with expectations uh, as design progressed. And then I, I can't state how valuable um, having uh, Gilbane and Banker Steel involved early was. Um, there were a lot of discussions on constructability, uh, steel availability, heavy, heavy sections versus plate girders. Um, discussions on connections, column splices, and configurations that, that really informed the, the detailing and simplified things uh, to achieve an economical structure. So with that, I'll pass it off on to Tyler, um, who will talk a little bit about the um, construction sequencing. Yeah, thanks, Jason. Um, so first of all, um, I'm very excited to be a part of the project in this presentation. Um, Gilbane was brought on as a CM at risk for Arlington Public Schools really between concept and SDs. Um, and obviously <laughs> realized right away how critical it was gonna be for early subcontractor involvement, specifically the fabricator and the erector actually. Um, so we had Banker Steel, as Jason had mentioned, and Memco Steel Erectors for our erector. Um, on top of just the, the steel sizing, procurement, availability of the members that, that Jason touched on, we also really started um, driving into the details of how this was gonna to go together. Um, obviously, you don't put a building together that looks like this every day, right? So um, there was a lot of planning and coordination on how this structure needed to go together um, and then what that did to all the follow-on work. Um, you know, when we signed our contract, our, our final GMP contract, our turnover date was about three days before students arrived. So we had zero um, room for flexibility in our project schedule. So we knew that we had to hit all of our dates perfectly and in a building and a structure that looks like this coming out of, out of the hole in an urban environment and then building a structure that is, is non-typical like this, we knew that planning was gonna be critical. So, um, you know, once we started working through what the structure, uh, the install sequence was, we quickly realized that our, our crane um, options were very limited. You're gonna see in some follow-on slides that uh, between site constraints um, and, and some of the size of the members and the reach that they were at, we, we were really limited. So again, just kind of, piggybacking on what Jason said about how important this early planning was, so the overall success of the job, really the, the project schedule. Um, so Jason, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, Tony had touched on it early, but um, just to kind of give an overview, and I, I, I'm sorry, Tony, I kind of uglied up your uh, beautiful renderings with some markups here, but um, you know, on the bottom side of the screen, just you can see the work our way counterclockwise. Those of you that know Roslyn, we had Wilson Boulevard on the south side of the screen. Um, you know, major thoroughfare, not something you can close without a lot of um, headache. On the right side, um, that we had an adjacent construction site that was, um, their support of excavation was roughly 55 to 60 feet below our, um, the grade, and we were at 30 to 35, and we were only 17 feet apart. Uh, believe it or not, we had cross ties that interacted. The, the two supportive excavation systems had to be designed together. Two separate contracts, um, one SOE subcontractor. So no crane options on the east side of the building. On the north side, we had an underground cistern. You can see our little sliver of real estate for a crane on the north side. Um, 
the white box on the top is a temporary fire station and then the 7-Eleven building. So in the typical urban environment, you know, we, we have, we're, we're landlocked on every side of the building. You can just imagine what it took to get deliveries in, um, you know, in a, in a site that looked like this, especially when Wilson Boulevard's as busy as it was. Um, so Jason, go ahead and go to the next slide. So, you know, for today, I want to focus on kind of this crane selection and, and what it meant and what our limiting factors were. Um, it's not uncommon on most jobs, but some of the unique things with the, the characteristics of the geometry of this building, what they did to us as a, as a general contractor. Um, you know, so for crane selection, we talked about site constraints. Uh, we showed you the limiting footprint on all the perimeters. Um, also, we can't forget that, you know, we were 35 feet to 40 feet below grade with our support of excavation. So naturally, we were not going to be able to, to crawl a mobile crane up on the perimeter of this SOE without some really, really um, significant beefing up of the SOE and, and potential deflection. So we were, we were limited with our footprint to begin with, and then we couldn't get tight to the perimeter of the building footprint. Um, and, and as you can see here, you're starting to see the building take shape. And we've referenced bars one through five, um, bar one being at the top. So this building, we determined through the sequencing and the early planning that we had to build this building bar one, bar two, bar three, bar four, bar five. So it was going to cascade away from us um, if you were looking at it from that north side of site where I, where I showed you that small red area where we had a mobile crane option. And as you can imagine, and as Jason was describing, it, as this building casc cascaded away from us on the north, our crane reach was getting longer and each bay felt like there was a bigger member <laughs> further away, right? So with our limitations on the south side of Wilson, um, and then obviously the building falling away from us and getting heavier, heavier as it fell, um, it really eliminated any ability to have a mobile crane on the north. So that's where we landed with the, um, the tower crane. Another important note, the reason we had to do a, a, a combo deal was you can see that the uh, elevator core, we, we made a decision early on to run that the whole way to the top. Um, what that did is that blocked us off for access. We, there was a conversation about putting a mobile crane, a large mobile down in the hole and crawl it back out. But when we ran the elevator core the whole way up, it would have created a blind pick for those really critical flying buttresses on the back side that were kind of overhanging our site. Um, so it, 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 after all the sequencing and discussions and early, early phase and planning, we ended up with two cranes. Um, the reason why this is also critical is we have a neighboring project that um, also needed the air right. So as you know, when you erect a tower crane, you, you know, you've got to get um, neighboring agreements, crane swing agreements um, with the neighboring sites. We had a great relationship with a neighboring developer um, and the general contractor that was doing that project. But at the same time, they had their needs and they, had, they needed to get a tower crane in the air as well. So what ended up happening is that the two owners, the developer in Arlington Public Schools, had to sign a crane swing agreement that gave our site a crane down guaranteed date, um, which meant we had to make sure we hit our schedule because no matter what, they were legally binding agreement with the neighboring site that our crane had to come down. So it just put all the more pressure on our early planning, um, our fabrication schedule, our delivery schedule, our sequencing and our erection. So um, Jason, if you go to the next slide, um, just kind of touching on some of the construction, I'll, I'll finish with the steel erection. We had a 20 week schedule. Um, we had a start date that got that we held, which was amazing. Um, all the fabrication pre-construction pre efforts were perfect. We held our start date and kudos to Banker and Memco, we held our finish date. So a building that looks like this, that we set a date early in pre-construction, not only did we hit the start date, we hit the finish date. So, um, you know, that wouldn't have been possible without the collaboration and the efforts with Soman and, and Big and Leo Daly early on. Um, just quickly, um, you know, what it takes to be the builder on a building that looks like this. Um, I highlighted just a few things that, you know, um, we learned from the back end of this. Some of them we knew going in, some of them were bigger challenges than we anticipated. Um, really what was a, a positive was, as you look at these bars, um, we were able to construct it as if the bars are their own, you know, small buildings, these rectangular volumes. So when bar one was built, um, instead of a traditional square building where you've got a frame and deck and you've got, you know, your OSHA limitations where you need certain decking above before you can start below. Um, as soon as we were decked, we were rolling and we were able to get a rough in our finished schedules for bar one started and it kick started, then bar two and bar three. Um, so we were really able to chase the structure with a good start of rough in and finishes. Um, and again, as I stated with a, with a tight schedule, we needed every day that we could get. Um, the challenges um, of this were, as you look at this building, you can kind of see it starting to take shape. You're seeing bar five and the auditorium trusses on the bottom right-hand side. Um, 
the problem with building this as a cascading away from us is we were leaving the largest square footage in some of the most complicated program till the very end. So the top of bar five had labs. Um, we had the auditorium space in bar five. But the most important thing is that the bottom of bar five was the heart and lungs of the building. So it was our major mechanical systems and our major electric electrical room. So um, that, you know, getting watertight, get, being able to get those systems and those areas built to provide the building with the permanent power and the um, climate controlled air to start finishes, that was a big challenge. Um, you know, some, some things that happened that were out, outside the project team's control that delayed some permanent power, um, you know, that, that really emphasized it. Some of this we knew, we were able to carry some temporary measures in pre-construction and working with uh, Big and Soman. We, we, we knew some of this was gonna be possible, but you know, ha had some snags with some of the, um, the, the permitting and stuff. And next thing you know, permanent power was a little bit delayed. Um, so that was one of the challenges that we faced just with the shape of this building. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we were able to plan for it and work around it for the most part. The probably my biggest lesson learned and the thing that I, I still lose sleep over is vertical transportation. Um, you know, Jason touched on kind of the MEP risers, everything was at the core and then it went out the bar. As the builder, it was our job to figure out how we were going to get materials, manpower, um, and ultimately trash out of this building. As you can see, um, the elevator core ran the whole way up. Um, so what we did is we put a temporary hoist, we built, we stick built a temporary hoist inside the core, left it there, used the temporary construction um, core inside the um, shaft, and then had to dismantle it at the end. But there was a duration between pulling down the temporary hoist and installing the permanent elevator um, where we had no vertical transportation. Um, and of course, this happens when we're in the middle of finishes and we're, you know, we've got dumpsters full of drywall leaving every other day. So, um, you know, I don't know if Jason and Tony remember this, but I'll never forget, there was probably six weeks of time where we were bringing in a hydro crane every night, working a second shift to just pull trash off of the terrace bars in order to keep the project moving in a safe manner. So, um, you know, so that's kind of the, the big lesson learned, but ultimately a huge success and a, a big thank you to Silman and uh, Big for being a part of this presentation and, and what, a, what an awesome project. So thanks guys. Yeah, and I'd like to thank everyone again, especially Tyler and, and Tony for jumping on this and, and being part of this. Um, as I was telling them, it's always more uh, interesting at some of these events to hear about uh, stuff that's not part of your discipline. So construction and architecture uh, to me are very interesting. So um, I know Tyler has to drop off, but uh, thank you both. Thank you guys so much for the presentation. It looks like we've got a question in the chat. Did you have to make any compromises to the interior space due to maximizing the outdoor terrace space with the fan configuration? If so, please describe. Um, I would say the short answer is no. Um, we started with a program that we received from the HB Woodlawn and what was then the Stratford uh, program, it's now the Union Kennedy Shriver program. Um, and we, we hosted a lot of workshops with all the different departments in the schools. And uh, ultimately the program that we all agreed to was what was in the building. And the terraces were kind of just additional spaces, additional exterior spaces, um, but they, they didn't detract from, from the, the basic programmatic elements that were required or the cost of them didn't result in removing certain important programmatic elements. Great, thank you. We've got another question coming in. Were there any sustainability standards applied and how did that affect the process? Sure, uh, Jason, I, I can answer this and if, if you wanna jump in, of course. Um, so we actually just, we, our target was lead silver for the duration of the, of the project, um, but we were tracking lead gold for the majority of, of, of the construction. And we just found out, I believe last week, that we officially hit lead gold with, with the, the project. So um, I think uh, a lot of kind of the more typical uh, sustainability practices and best practices were incorporated into all aspects of the project to ensure that we were able to hit um, at, at worst lead silver, but obviously uh, lead gold. That's great, congrats. 
Um, I guess I don't see any other questions coming in, but uh, thank you all for joining. Thank you for your time. And I hope you enjoyed the presentation. We will be following up with the PDH credits at a later date. All right, thank, thank you. you. All.